Yo, and welcome to the EPM show. I am Blake Bozart. This is my co-host, Chad Pike. What's going on, man? Not much, man. Excited to be here. Excited to be here. Today, we have another legend, Gary Kokins. Gary, how are you? Always good, but I don't always tell the truth. <laughs> well, we're super pumped to have you. This is the EPM show, so all things enterprise performance management. And uh, we like to say we try to give you a unfair career advantage and Gary is somebody that I like to call, I don't know if you're okay with this, Gary, but I like to call you the godfather of EPM. And so we have a legend our midst today. He's been, he's been at this for a while, and he has a ton of insights that we're going to talk through today. Before we get into the meat of our show, if we're talking about EPM, we're talking about where the industry is going, trends that Gary is seeing now, things that we should, we should be thinking about in our careers, we should start doing, stop doing. But before we get into that, we like to do our patented question, which is tell us about you and your career in 60 seconds. So you and your career 60 seconds, I got a little timer here and we'll let you go, man. Oh, all right, let's go fast. First, I'm 73, but I feel like I'm 43. I've had a 40 plus year career. I started with my education in industrial engineering and operations research at Cornell University, got my MBA at Northwestern University's Kellogg, spent 30 years, well, first, first 10 years in the industry, big conglomerate, and then many years in consulting with Deloitte, KPMG. And then for 16 years, I was with SaaS. Many don't recognize SaaS. It's the world's largest privately owned software vendor, data science, analytics, and the like. And now I'm just sort of having fun educating people, doing a little bit of gig work. Fam, two grandsons, uh, 20 and 22, two daughters, raised in Chicago, go Cubs, go Bears, go White Sox. <laughs> That was impressive. And that's got, what is that, eight seconds to spare there? That was impressive. Really good stuff. Sorry about the game last night, by the way. We recorded this right after uh, Sunday Night Football with Bears Packers, but it's okay. I was, I was going Bears, too, just so you know. But with that, so, Chad, you have another uh, qu couple questions we're going to ask. Yeah, you. just a couple more before we really dive into the content. We're going to go rapid fire here, Gary. So the first question for you, if you could go pro at anything, what would it be? Oh, it'd be football. At Cornell, I was a two-year varsity football player, linebacker, so football would be my choice. So then I can guess that you would play for the Bears, right? <laughs> that would be your team of choice. <laughs> History of great linebackers. Dick Buckingham's <laughs> linebacker, the Chicago Bears. <laughs> I can see it now. <laughs> That's awesome. Second question, rapid fire. If you could sit down to lunch with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Hmm. Mark Twain. I just like Mark Twain's wit and the ability to say complicated things in a simpler way that people can understand it. And I pride myself doing that similar. Well, it'll be a test to see whether I can do that during this podcast. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, that's awesome. It's funny you mentioned that. That sounds like good career advice, too, if you can learn how to explain complex things very simply and succinctly, right? We'll do well. <laughs> hey, that's what, that's what we try to do with this show, too. This is going to this is going to be a good challenge. So, Gary, you have been an evangelist for EPM for decades now. We've traveled the world. You've given a lot of speeches, talked to a lot of different crowds and people. Let's ask you, what is EPM all about from your perspective? And what trends do you recognize that are going on? Well, there's a lot of confusion and lack of consensus about what EPM is. But to keep it simple, you know, it's not a process, it's not a system, it's not a technology, it's actually the integration of many methods. And many of these methods have been around for decades, some even before computers. And I'll, I'll, I'll describe some of them later on, but think of all these methods like profit analysis, strategy management, with KPIs, enterprise risk management, lean management process as gears in a machine, and you get a lot more power when you seamlessly integrate them. One of the problems, though, is when organizations do implement some, they do it in isolation of each other. So you got like risk management part of the building, you got process planning people, the other part of the building, you got strategy people, you get a lot more power when you integrate them. In terms of trends, just the broad trend is the increasing adoption rate of these methods, because it's really been slow up till now. And uh, which is a frustration. We'll talk about maybe some of the reasons for the slow adoption rate later. You, you mentioned one thing you said as of recently, there's been increasing adoption. Can you maybe kind of dive into a little bit of maybe what's caused that most recent interest in, and kind of spike in interest in EPM? Yeah. And this is kind of a laundry list and this may take me two or three minutes. I'll try to be crisp 
One of the first ones is the executive frustration with strategy failure. The executives are good at formulating strategy. Their frustration is failure to execute it. And one of the EPM methods, if you will, that resolves this is the strategy map and the balance scorecard. Many are familiar with Kaplan and Norton's you know, methodology with key performance indicators. The second one is increased accountability. Today, there's no place to hide. Managers and employees will be monitored. They will be measured. Doesn't mean that their job's at risk, but it could adversely impact their salary increases and job promotions. Third mm-hmm. one is more rapid decision-making. You know, unlike a few years ago, you could test and learn, have meetings and conference rooms. Today, people are on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. They need to make decisions in near real time. Fourth, mistrust of the management accounting system. You know, we're not talking about the external financial accounting system. We're talking about the internal one. And many of the CFOs, quite frankly, and accountants are underserving their line managers because they use these simplistic ways like overhead cost allocations, spreading butter across bread on these things. And activity-based costing is a commonly accepted method to resolve that. Next, poor customer value management. You know, customers are the source of value creation, financial value creation and wealth for shareholders and owners. You know, but not very many of the accountants are actually helping the line managers, sales and marketing to understand which customers are more attractive to retain, to grow, to win back and acquire, which types not, how much profitability do we get from from customers? They can do that with activity-based costing also. Next, budgeting. You know, the budgeting process is broken and everybody knows it. You know, it basically is out of date a couple of months after you publish it. It caves into the loudest voice and strongest muscle. At the near the end of the year, if a if a manager's not on the glide path to spend all their budget, what do they do? They start spending, you know, needlessly, uselessly, because they know that the budget's going to be pegged. So there's ways to go to get to what is called capacity sensitive driver based budgeting and then redo it and make a driver based rolling financial forecast. Next, dysfunctional supply chain management. The problem there, those of you who are listening that may actually be not in retail, but in a supply chain, most customers treat their suppliers as the enemy. You know, let's just pound on the supplier, negotiate lower prices. We put them out of business. So what? We'll get another supplier. That's got to stop. It needs to be a marriage. Supply chains are competing against other supply chains. And then finally, unfulfilled return on investment promises from large IT systems like ERP systems. And the issue there is those ERP systems are great, you know, but if you ask an uh, IT director, how well do you think the ROI met or exceeded what the software salesman sold you on many years ago after you went through all this, they'd be hard pressed to say yes. You do need to implement those methods, but they produce a lot of data, but not necessarily information. What the EPM methods, all of this sort of suite, these gears, I've already mentioned a few examples do, is they convert the data into information. And so the ROI comes out like seeds from the ground. So that's just a handful of what's causing interest in enterprise performance management. Uh, that's that's so good. And I feel like if I could, like if I'm understanding you correctly, it, it really sounds like it comes down to executives are seeing the gap between strategy and execution and they're driving for the follow through, not just in one place, but across the organization. And that's really what is driving it in a, bunch of different ways that that you mentioned. That's awesome. Yeah, but I would also add that what's needed are facts, Mm fact-based information, you Mm -hmm. know, because listen to this, in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. You know, Mm -hmm. I'll repeat that. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion (laughs) is a good one. But usually... Usually the biggest opinion wins, which is opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So to the degree they're making decisions on gut feel or intuition or flawed and misleading information, which comes from that traditional like butter spreading of overhead, and the organization's at risk. There is nobody better to be describing EPM, what it is, and and these drivers than than you, Gary. So I, I want to follow up on this though, because when we talk about how, yeah, there's been a lot more interest in it. There's been a lot more adoption towards it. What is it that prevents companies when they have this revelation, right? And again, you've been evangelizing this for years, but when they had the revelation of okay, we need to we need to do this in a way that's connected. We need to do this in a way that's you know not not these independent spreadsheets and random teams, but but in a strategic and connected way. When, when they have that realization, they have their EPM vision, what prevents them from actually realizing and seeing the transformation they, they want to see? 
there's a few obstacles and barriers. You know, now one of them is sort of IT technical. It's dirty data, low quality data, but the IT department knows how to clean that up. They got tools called extraction, transform, and load ETL. And some larger companies may have multiple hardware vendors, Dell, IBM, so forth, Hewlett Packard. IT can fix that. The second obstacle is this perception that it's way too complex to implement these various methods, like activity-based costing. And most people think, oh, activity-based costing, it's not worth it. It's too complicated. It takes six months. Everybody has to fill out timesheets. All of those are misconceptions. <laughs> I have been a technique that I've been using for years called rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling. You build the ABC model in three weeks. It starts with a workshop with a bunch of people, real fast, couple of iterations, you're done. But the real obstacle, the biggest one, has got really nothing to do with technology or methods. It's about people. And it starts with resistance to change. It's human nature. People like the status quo. Only babies like change, you know, change of diapers. <laughs> Other other issues, not want uh, not fear of other, not wanting others to know the truth. Oh, I don't want that other department to know what my costs are. Fear of being measured, fear of being held accountable. And I'll say it, weak leadership. You know, not every executive team's got the highest IQ. So notice all those examples, nothing to do with technology. It's about people. So the real solution there is managers and executives have to basically have some behavioral change management skills. But most of them are not skilled at that. They don't have degrees in psychology or sociology. They're all what I call Newtonians, like Isaac Newton, the physicist. To them, the world's a bit <laughs> between. You know, give me the levers, pull these dials. They need to have a little bit of Darwinian, like Charles Darwin, the organism, sense and response. So those are some of the barriers and obstacles slowing the adoption rate. So we just had a recent episode with Ray Corbello of Anaplan. And it's funny, Gary, because he hit on some of these themes too. And he talked about how it's one thing when you have a change champion at a senior level and they're saying, you know, Hey, this is the direction we need to go as a company, but it's a completely different thing when you actually get the people on the ground floor involved and on board and bought in the ones who actually have been doing the disparate Excel spreadsheets processes over the years. Right. And, and that's what true kind of change looks like. And, but leaders, leaders have to be able to get, everyone on board and body in to be able to do that. And what you just hit on, he also hit on, which is culture. And uh, it, it, it's the, it's the intangible. It's the thing that, you know, it's not the machine piece, but it, but it matters so much. And just hearing you kind of espoused, okay, there's some, there's some technical reasons why, but really it's a, it's a cultural, it's a, it's an abdication of leadership sometimes that prevents us from realizing the value that we set out to realize when we wanted to redesign our planning. Well, you, you bring up leadership, and I, this is my observation about leadership. And I know there's a 100 books written on leadership, but, geez, I don't know if any of them really, you know, all work. But my position is the best leaders and the best executives in the past had the best answers. Today, I don't think that's the case. Today, I think the best leaders and best executives have the best questions. There is too much volatility. There's too much uncertainty. There's too much complexity for them to rely, again, on their gut feel or intuition, you know, or sixth sense, or the types of answers they provided earlier in their, their career that got them promoted to the top. They need to create a culture for investigation and discovery, you know, and tolerance for making mistakes as long as you learn from your mistakes. And when you do investigation to discover, and I don't know whether we have time to kind of slip this in, about analytics, because I mentioned that EPM is really the integration of multiple methods. And when you integrate them seamlessly like gears, the power of EPM goes up, but it becomes even more powerful when you embed analytics into the methods like regression, correlation, clustering, segmentation. And I know, as I mentioned, though, some of the people listening say, oh, I took those courses in college. I just wanted a passing grade and get the heck out of there. Well, well, sorry, you know, <laughs> data science. Data science is here. But the good news is you don't have to go to your attic or basement to go dig out your old textbook, but you do need skill sets in your organization with these competencies to do advanced analytics. Gary, can I jump back in on one thing that you said? You, you, you touched on leadership and how leadership leaders today need to be the ones that have the best questions. What are some things that like EPM professionals, people in this space can start doing today to cultivate 
maybe a culture of curiosity on their team or a mindset of curiosity you know, in, in their selves for their own career and for the advancement of the team? Well, well, th this is a you're asking me something that's even more important because I mentioned about change management's needed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and oftentimes the executives, they're so busy with short term priorities and firefighting, they don't have the time to actually kind of sometimes concentrate on implementing these methods. So one way is, and I this is to get change, you really need to create the need for change. And there's mm -hmm. actually an equation called D times V times F is greater than R. R stands for resistance, big number. So since D times V and F are multiplicative, if any of them are zero or very small, you're not gonna, the left side's not gonna overcome the right side. So what's D, V, and F? D starts with discomfort with the current state. There needs to be some dissatisfaction. V is a vision of what better looks like. So if they've got big pain, you know, the big D, they're looking for a lifeline, you know, so that's where the V comes in. But F is the sleeper. F is first practical steps, because if they think your EPM method is impractical or over theoretical or unaffordable, they're not going to go through. The reason I do this D, V, and F <clears throat> is back to your what I call pain questions. What managers can do, it could be a little career limiting, is start asking their executives at the top, does everybody understand your strategy? Are we measuring the right things? Do we know which customers are more or less profitable? Is our budgeting process really effective? You see, those are just four examples, and then you can have 40 examples. Each one of them is to basically, we call the FUD, F-U-D, fear, uncertainty, and dirt, make that executive feel a little uncomfortable so that they'll answer the, they'll ask the question, well, how do I get all the employees to understand the strategy? Kaplan and Orton strategy map. How do we understand which customers are more or less profitable? Use activity-based costing and go below the product gross profit margin line, including selling, marketing, distribution, customer serve to create a profit and loss statement for each customer. So pain questions are really what my suggestion is for young people, actually managers at any age, to get good at pain questions. Got to be careful because you don't want to irritate the boss too much, but you want to kind of like nudge them you know, stimulate them to say, how would I do that? And then you could come in with, well, here are these methods and they're proven and they work. There are some nuggets there. Great question. Great answer. I want to get you out on, on this question, Gary. And that is, we have a number of people listening that are either A, interested in having a career in EPM or are in the EPM space already, probably the majority of listening in the EPM space already, and they want to grow their career in the space. What, what kind of advice would you have for them? Well, one of the key parts is how do you get started or how do you basically keep the thing rolling? And I, I don't want to, I'm going to return back to something I mentioned about rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling. If I could do a little bit of a plug, people, I hope you'll be able to give them my email address or website. I've been training consultants and CPA firms because I'm kind of done with consulting. You know, I'm too old for it and I don't need it to do it. How to implement in like a couple of days, even a strategy map and a balanced scorecard. It's a one day workshop. So it's it's a quick start, you know, people, and it's engaging because you're doing it to your own company. It's not some sort of like Harvard Business School case study. So, you know, my advice is learn these sort of like fast Pareto law, 80, 20, you know, ready, fire, aim, you know, methods to get going. And then I would come back to, you know, don't basically try to show off how smart you are, even though you might be clever and skilled. Use the questions. People will respect you more by the quality of the questions you ask. Just like you're asking me questions on this interview, you know, they'll respect you more for their questions. So get good at asking questions and then being a good listener. Boom. It's great. <laughs> And I, I love the addition of the Pareto principle too. That's something that we that we're very passionate about as well. So, uh, Gary, to that point, where could people find you? Where's the best place to look you up? Well, my website is www.garycokins.com. G A R Y C is in clock. O K I N S N S. There are on the tabs below it many articles I've written, all free. You don't have to pay for anything. You can invite me in LinkedIn. And my email address is gcokens at garycokens.com. Sweet action. Well, hey, thanks so much for being on the show. This has been a blast. It's already been a blast getting to know you more. And I think there's a ton of stuff that we could also talk with you about in the future. But uh, we appreciate all the, all the insights, all the nuggets that you brought today. So thanks so much, Gary. My Take pleasure. Care. Thanks, thanks for inviting Gary. me. 
Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Wherever you're consuming this, if it's YouTube, if it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, we appreciate you. Make sure you're subscribed. We have a lot more amazing guests on the way, a lot more great content. We're doing our best to bring you value and have fun while we do it. And we really want this to be a career advantage listening to this show and we want you to enjoy it. So it means a lot. Make sure you're subscribed for what's what's to come. And also, if you're up for it, it would mean a lot if you leave us a like, a comment, a rating, a review, whatever platform you're on. That really helps and it gets us fired up when we see those. So I appreciate you guys. Find us on LinkedIn. I'm Blake Bozarth, my co-host Chad Pike with a Y. Would love to connect with you there. Have an awesome day. See you next time. Peace.